Hello everyone, I'm Daniel Niefler, I'm from the Google in GemLab and I would like to talk to you now about this GemLab specific topic and um, you people out there in the trade, in the gemstone business, you have to do with GemLabs so it might be something interesting for you to know. I want to talk about consistency, um, consistency and also inconsistency of GemLabs and how we as a gem lab can try to um, improve and maximize that consistency by applying standards. Um, so your first reaction might be consistency. What consistency? These labs, you know, they are um, the origin calls, the country of origin determinations uh, that labs are doing are inconsistent sometimes. Even the treatments, you know, one lab might call it a heated stone, the other lab might call it um, not a heated stone. The, um, even the identification might be um, inconsistent among different labs. One lab might call a stone a ruby, the other lab might call it a pink sapphires. And then, of, of course, also this uh, the topic of the trade color calls, you know, um, pigeon blood, um, royal blue, and even other terms that quite often are not um, granted to one and the same stone in a consistent way among different gem labs. Um, so there are different levels of inconsistency. So let's define the term first. There are inconsistency between labs. So lab A says it is a pigeon blood uh, ruby. Lab B says it's not a pigeon blood ruby. There might be inconsistency um, over time, meaning that we might have given Kashmir um, to a stone uh, in the nine, early 1990s. And today we might not give Kashmir to that same stone. So there was somehow a change of um, opinion um, occurring in one and the same lab. Then there might be inconsistency between different people of one lab. That's something that the trade might not uh, notice too much because then the lab is usually trying to uh, consolidate such um, difference, such inconsistency among different lab gemologists. And there might even be an individual inconsistency so that one and the same person might come to a conclusion on a stone at some point in time and a couple of weeks, months, years, decades later, the conclusion might be different. So the reputation that gem labs have in terms of their consistency of the results is a uh, mixed. Um, sometimes the, the people in the trade think that these uh, specifically when it comes to origin determination, that it's more of a guessing game than indeed a proper science. So um, that's why we would like to give you a little glimpse into how we are doing things and how we can improve consistently. So there is a certain wish that the trade has a certain expectation and there's a certain reality that we have to deal with and also the trade have to accept it. So obviously the wish is that a result that has been given at some point in time is going to remain the same spatially, so over different laboratories, um, independent from the gemologist that is working in that laboratory, but also independent from the time. Um, so a result that we have given 50 years ago is still the same today and is still the same in 50 years. That's the wish. The reality is, and I'm citing here Heraclit, uh, this Pantare, everything flows. Everything is in a flow. So uh, if you stand uh, in a river today and you stand in the same river at the same place the next day, the river is somehow different because there's other type, other water flowing through it. And that's kind of the same uh, as a gem lab when we are um, doing our work, you know, the environment might have changed, hopefully not too fast and not too rapidly but over time it definitely does, and sometimes it even does abruptly. Um, inconsistency is nothing new. Um, think of uh, the term ruby, which in the past has been used for all type, basically of red gemstones, be that spinel or red garnet, and only when um, the um, scientific methods became available to determine exactly the identity of a gemstone, then the term ruby became more clearly defined. We also know that in the past, some decades ago, there were stones from Sri Lanka and then later on also stones from Madagascar, blue sapphires, 
that were strongly resembling um, the Kashmir sapphires, and there's a significant number of reports out there in the trade uh, on Sri Lankan stones and on some Madagascar stones that say Kashmir sapphire. So there, the labs, including ourselves, we had a blind spot, and we were not aware of that blind spot for a couple of, uh, for quite some time. And um, still nowadays, we're going to get those old reports back and we have to fix that error from the past. Then let's change to the treatment topic, unheated ruby. Um, within a couple of years or say within 10, 15 years, the threshold to call a stone or a ruby specifically heated has been lowered. And this lowering of the threshold has been uh, caused by the development of more and more sophisticated methods to heat a stone to um, induce a bettering of the color without affecting the, the stone overall too much. So specifically not by affecting the inclusions. So uh, once Gemlabs became aware of that, they also had to kind of uh, beef up their analytics and study the stones more carefully and um, stones that got a no heat treatment call some 20 years ago nowadays might get a heat treatment call because there are these specific low temperature heat treatment methods that are applied more and more. Paraiba tourmaline is another example you know Paraiba was a term that is it was initially coined based on the region in Brazil where these um, uh, nice blue tourmalines were found and um, then it developed into a into a trade term specifying the color um, and then once the Mozambican and then later on the Nigerian um, Paraiba type tourmalines appear on the market the, the common sense in the trade was that they should also be called Paraiba tourmalines because it is rather um, determining or de describing a color than only an origin. And then that's also what the lab were, labs were following. There's other sources of inconsistencies. Uh, think of the many types of gemstones that are usually treated, you know, such as rubellite, which the majority of the rubellites gets irradiated, aquamarine, paraiba tourmaline that are mostly heated. Um, but quite many of these treatments, they cannot even be detected. So, um, that's basically a blind spot that the gem labs at least are aware of, but it's not something we can do about much. So one day, if we're going to have a way to um, an affordable way to determine if these stones are treated or not, then that's going to be another wave of inconsistency by gem labs having to contradict their results from the past. And it's quite possible that as we speak today, we might miss out on something and creating faulty reports which we only might learn in a couple of months or a couple of years only about so that's somehow a reality of the business that we are in and we try to deal it as good as possible so the reasons you know to continue is that what are the reasons that inconsistencies occur is of course new mines that are um, coming up and new mines obviously producing new material that so far was unknown and that might overlap with um, material from uh, the, the geological properties might overlap with material from known mines but also the old mines the well-known mines they might produce um, material that is different from the material that was already described in the past and in the literature then um, we have in our business uh, a lot of very innovative people. They are finding smart ways, good ways to improve um, the color, the clarity of the of gemstones that might be of the not perfect quality. And not everybody is kind of open or, at, or not open from the very beginning and kind of might want to make profit from the gem labs not noticing that a stone has been subjected to some kind of treatment so this is on the short term a very profitable business on the long term it's of, of course devastating because um, the end consumer uh, who is the ultimate engine the ultimate driver of the demand in gemstones might lose confidence and might shift to other um, luxury goods 
Then um, also development of analytical tools, analytical methods might kind of be a reason for inconsistency. So that nowadays we might find more details, more insight, we can scrutinize the stones more, and then the data that we can collect can lead to different, um, different results. That goes hand in hand with the development of knowledge. You know, there are plenty of people out there, institutes that are doing scientific research, and some of the knowledge that they are doing, we are doing, and are sharing with each other might lead to different interpretations. And then there is also the market itself that is changing. So the consumer is more and more pushing for full disclosure. You know, they they want to know in more detail what it is. They might they might want to see behind the sparkle and know what's really what has happened to that stone. Um, we also feel a certain demand um, with, with quality grading. So far, there is no globally accepted quality grading for colored gemstones. So that implies color grading, of course. And then there are other other um, uh, trends in the market, such such as the trend for uh, sustainability, and um, uh, certain ethical standards, environmental standards that are maintained. So that is also creating new realities, a new environment to which also gem labs ultimately have to adapt. So this is the reality, the environment that we are that we find ourselves in um, we can, we as gem labs we can do something to improve the consistency in different ways these are five uh, points that i have put together the first one is to build and maintain a common knowledge base secondly we have to get the most out of the stones so analyze better and deeper third point we is the standardization Fourth point is um, define lab principles along which uh, you want to work. And the fifth one is to uh, also impose certain standards of wording to make them understood, understandable, and also to make them um, clear and honest. So the first, first important point to um, that we have to tackle is to build and maintain a common knowledge base. So there's um, in the gem lab you have a lot of knowledge in the heads of the people. You know they are usually very experienced gemologists. They have seen thousands, ten thousands of stones. They have traveled the world. They have um, very um, comprehensive knowledge. And but this individual knowledge that you might have in people, you have to translate into formalized knowledge, and that's not exactly easy. So you have to um, you have to um, develop manuals, you have to de develop databases, you also have to make publications so that they get your knowledge gets peer reviewed. That's the first part of that first step, then the reference collection, you know, the, the, our, the work that we are doing as a gem lab is, um, is uh, forensic by nature, so we basically take the unknown stone from the client, we look at its properties and we compare this pattern of properties with the patterns of the prop with the patterns of the known stones that we have in our uh, reference collection. So regardless whether we do identification only, whether we do treatment detection, whether we do um, country of origin determination, we need to have all the, the, the full spectrum of stones that a stone possibly could be. So we have to have the natural ones, the synthetic ones, we have to have all type of treatments and obviously the untreated ones, and we have to have samples from each commercially relevant deposit in the world of that type of stems, gemstones. So quite a big job that one has to do. At the Gubelin Gem Lab, we are in a very privileged position to own probably the world's most complete and best documented a collection of colored gemstones worldwide. Dr. Gubelin has started that collection in the middle of the last century. We have now maintained it since uh, by now it's more than 28,000 uh, colored gemstones from all relevant mines in the world. We are updating this collection, of course. You know, we are doing field trips. It's very important that we do field trips so that we can go to the mines ourselves, get samples of which we know they are authentic. Um, also get samples from different sources, so via different people to kind of have a, a cross-checking. And then 
once we have these samples, we have to document them. We have to document carefully how we got them, how sure are we that it's an authentic samples. And then we do the gemological work on those samples and put all the data into a properly maintained database. And once we have done that, then we can actually start the work and build our conclusions based on empirically facts on the basis of the database, rather than just the opinion or the, the gut feeling of an experienced uh, gemologist or a couple of experienced gemologists. Obviously, we need a uh, staff that is well trained. You know, we believe that the gemological training is a great start, but we want to have some knowledge in earth sciences. And then we also want to train the people on the job. A uh, gemologist that is starting in our lab is usually undergoing uh, in, uh, on the job in house training of at least three years until uh, he or she can then sign. Um, origin reports. This building here shows the approach, how we are doing our work. So the very basis, the very fundament is the reference collection. Then this experience and the expertise of our people, also structured and formalized um, knowledge, not only uh, what is in the head of the people. Then the three pillars, they represent the analysis that we are doing and we can group them into microscopic features into spectroscopic features and into chemical features, so the chemical fingerprint that we're collecting. And all this together then allows us to come to a conclusion, which is the roof of this building here. So that's what I mean with the second point, get the most uh, out of the gemstones. You know, we should not only stick to microscopy, we should not only stick to laser ablation ICPMS, we should collect the data as broad as possible and as complete as possible. And when we do, when we collect a large number of observations, then the conclusion that we make is also more robust than if we would only rely on a two, three, four observations and jump to a conclusion already. To stick to that um, second point, get the most out of the stones. Um, I mentioned it already, you know, the, the more data we collect, the better the conclusion. Quite often the number of data that we collect on every stone can uh, reach a number of 100 or even more. Um, with this method here, the laser ablation ICPMS, which is a, a wonderful method to, um, to detect trace element and ultra trace elements in most type of, um, of uh, colored gemstones, we already get a very high number of, of data that we can then evaluate. So um, that also implies that we have to find smart ways to evaluate that data because to deal with 100 uh, data points or more is a task that the human brain, the human eye is um, not really built to uh, cope with. We are, have also started a couple of years ago to do age determination in situ on the client stones. We can do that on sapphires, for example, so rubies, which have tiny um, zircon inclusions. We can probe those zircons because they contain uranium and lead. And uh, the uranium and lead is um, offering us a little um, a clock, you know, a radiometric clock um, that allows us to determine the age of formation. And because we know that some type of gemstones or some um, areas where gemstones grown are older than other ones, this helps us or gives us a valuable hint for the determination of the country of origin. The third point is the standardization. We believe that by standardizing the systems we have, the tools we have, the processes, we can drastically increase the consistency of our work. That also implies that we have to reduce the human factor. You know? So instead of giving complete freedom to the gemologist in what he is looking at, how he is making interpretation, we are basically um, standardizing all also the data gathering and the way the data is processed quite a bit of the of the data evaluation is already done with um, the help of computers so that it's done in a consistent way but it starts already earlier you know we have to already define how the instruments are set up you know how the instruments are um, um, calibrated um, and how exactly we're gonna put the instrument into the stone to make sure that the data is also collected in a consistent way. And I can confirm you that in the Gubelin Gem Lab, as you know, we are running three different labs. 
Switzerland, Hong Kong, and New York. And the instrument calibration is done in, ex in exactly the same way. The, the way we are gathering the data is done in the same way. And the way we are evaluating the data is in exactly the same way on one type of software and according to one type of, um, of process. On the left, uh, sorry, on the right side, you see uh, an example of a standard operating procedure. Um, these, our work is basically um, ruled by such um, standard operating procedures that tell us how we have to do an individual task, be that um, handling an instrument or um, collecting data or um, maintaining an instrument and so on. I would like to give you an example of a term that is um, very well known in the industry, in the trade, and that's the term pigeon blood red. Pigeon blood red is, uh, uh, the term was coined um, for the rubies from Burma and the rubies that have a very high quality, that have a specific color and that have, um, that are obviously very rare. Um, the, this term has kind of uh, developed also into a brand and that brand has many famous brands, you know, they ask for a premium price. So the trade is very keen to get uh, rubies that have this term or to have reports that show that term. Um, so there's a lot of pressure also towards the labs and um, we believe that as a gem lab, uh, we also have a responsibility that we are doing um, assigning that term pigeon blood red to the rubies in a in a consistent way. So we have um, many many years ago, more than ten years ago, defined a set of quite um, stringent criteria. We also tried to be consistent not only among or within the Gibbling Gem Lab, but we were a um, couple of years ago also um, enlarging that circle and we have, uh, have been sitting together with the SSF, the Swiss Geological Institute, because we felt that somehow they are applying kind of a similar standard and uh, in order to make the life of the trade easier, we were then trying to harmonize the definition uh, of the term pigeon blood and also royal blue and also to harmonize the way we are testing the stone. It doesn't forcibly mean that um, 100% of the stones, um, that in 100% of the stones, also both labs would come to the same conclusion. But having defined or having harmonized the, um, the criteria and having harmonized the testing procedure already, um, already improves the consistency quite a lot. And we believe that only very, very uh, few stones get a conflicting result between the SSF and the Gibbelin Gem Lab. Let me give you a bit of um, insight into the criteria that we are applying. First of all, pigeon blood red is a color call. So the color has to have the right hue. We are using master sets to determine the hue of the unknown stone and see whether it fits with the, with the, the masters that um, that comply with the definition. Um, the color has to have a, um, a strong saturation and a medium tone. Um, absolutely no indications of treatment are accepted, you know, so it must not have any heat treatment indications, it must not have any uh, fissures that are um, filled with an oil or another clarity enhancing substance, uh, no other treatment, of course, you know, um, leave away the, um, the lead glass treatment or diffusion treatment or any other treatment. Um, so only absolutely untreated stone can qualify for the term pigeon blood. Then, the, um, as I said, you know, the term pigeon blood has been coined for um, Burmese rubies initially. So the definition is also based on the properties that the best uh, Burmese rubies show, and this is uh, what is very typical for Burmese rubies is a medium to strong fluorescence under UV light. So that's what we want to see also for um, uh, that that we would expect expect to see from a pigeon blood wannabe ruby from any origin in the world. Since we talk about that, please understand that um, there is no restriction regarding the country of origin for 
a pigeon blood red ruby. We have already given pigeon blood red rubies to stones from other countries, including Madagascar, including Tajikistan, including Afghanistan. So there are stones that are not from Burma that fulfill all the criteria, and hence we also grant them that term pigeon blood red. Um, as a side note, it, it was only a handful of stones that were qualifying. So the most of the pitch blood rib rubies still are coming from um, from Burma. Then the clarity and transparency is a very important criteria. Uh, a stone that wants to qualify for pitch blood red must not show any eye visible inclusions. It must, must not show any dark inclusions and it must not show any major window or extinction. The only um, kind of inclusion that a stone can have is a little bit of silk, provided that the silk is not um, having this white reflection and that the silk is not negatively affecting the transparency of the stone. But a little bit of silk that is kind of um, making the light um, or the color softer and uh, just slightly diffusing the light is, um, is perfectly accept acceptable. So much about the criteria for pitch and blood red. Now, just a little comment about why the, um, the consistency uh, in the gem testing industry overall is so low. Um, fact is, you know, that if you would have perfect consistency, you would have global standards that everybody is sticking to. There are no such standards. There are hardly any international standards, you know. There is the LMHC, the Lab Manual Harmonization Committee, that is defining um, certain standards on the wording of um, terms that are used by different gem labs. The Gibbelin Gem Lab is part of that um, lab manual harmonization committee. But otherwise, there are not too many international standards. Of course, there are SIPSHO Blue Books. Of course, there are other industry bodies or, um, or industry watchdogs that are issuing certain standards. But usually, they are not detailed enough to, in, to um, ensure consistency um, to ensure in a consistency down to the level of the of detail that labs are working with. National standards might be in place, but of course not in, in, a, in, in all the countries. Switzerland, as far as I know, has no national standards defined on how to uh, apply um, uh, terms um, in, the, in, in the gemstone area. And then there are lab standards, you know, obviously we in the Ghibli lab, we have a lot of um, lab standards that we are applying uh, so with that at least we can kind of improve in the consistency within uh, the Ghibli gem lab. But the relative absence of standards higher up, you know, national, international and global, um, tells us also a bit or gives us a bit of an explanation why the consistency is not as good as it could be. Let me go to my fourth point ensure compliance with lab principles. As I said in my previous slide, you know, a gem lab should define certain standards, should also define certain working principles that goes somehow into ethics as well. So a gem lab should be independent and neutral from any um, um, uh, trade body or from any uh, major client um, so that the lab can act independently. Um, then a lab should work in a way that the, the final result is not um, imposed by one single person, but that at least two people or ideally three people um, are um, looking at the stone and also in charge of finalizing the result. Then a very important point, which is hopefully applied in all gem labs, that only the information that you get out of the stone yourself you must consider in coming up with a conclusion. You cannot kind of accept or, or in, I mean, you can listen to what your client tells you about your, your stone, but you must not kind of take it as a fact into your decision making process. Then you should also have no bias towards a stone or towards a client. Um, in the Google in Gem Lab, for example, we are cutting off any client information before the stone goes to the analytics and the gemologist. So the gemologist do not know who the client is because it might have an influence. If you know that this stone is coming from the unknown small dealer, you know, which usually gives heavily treated stone stones to us, or if it is a famous auction house that is usually dealing in big 
um, uh, untreated stones. Then also uh, another detail of the, the pictures, the photographs on the reports, they should be kind of not overly photoshopped, you know, they should give a realistic impression of the stone. And then um, when there is, um, when the client is exerting some kind of pressure to you to get a certain result, if the client is kind of, um, you know, offering better business, more business to you, then you should resist that um, pressure and resist that uh, temptation and just stick to your standards. Although you, a, a part of your um, revenue might fall away, still in the long run, uh, the only, the, the most important asset you're having as a gem lab is your reputation. And you might not, you do not want to risk that reputation for a few extra dollars here and there. Then one lab principle is also that we have to accept our limitations. So the fact that um, gem labs are issuing no origin reports is a sign of strength rather than weakness because the, the indications that we get from a stone might be insufficient, might not be unambiguous enough that we can come to a conclusion. So the best professional decision is to say, we don't know, you know we, this is a no origin it's a no origin stone. We cannot say whether the stone is uh, Madagascar or Sri Lanka, if it's Burma or Madagascar. We do not know sometimes even whether the stone is heated or unheated. You know, that happens as well. So it, uh, we should kind of have the strength to also go to the client and say, we don't know. My last point is wording, you know, and there are different trends, you know, the gem lab, wants to have a wording that is scientifically correct. You know, many people in the gem labs are scientists and they are really like to have the very accurate, very um, correct wording. The trade, they want to have a wording that is um, um, kind of pleasing the stone or that is, um, you know, the, the, um, giving a, a wording that is, helps the trade selling the stone to a very good price. So that might be already a bit conflicting with what the lab is saying. Uh, the trade might also be tempted to maybe not say certain things which might not um, look too good to the end consumer or to his direct client. The final customer, however, he wants to have a wording that is transparent and complete, but also understandable. So gem labs might have a tendency to be, to be too complex. The trade might have a tendency to be um, too euphemistic, you know, to kind of um, um, oversell the stone. Whereas the final customer basically want to have simple, comprehensive, straight information and might also be grateful to have um, some kind of hint where he can learn more about um, that stone or the background of that stone or the origin or how labs are functioning. So um, that's we in the Google in Gem Lab are also trying to accommodate in the services that we do. We try to be short and concise on the report to bring transparency between the seller and the buyer because the report is still the document that is mainly used uh, along the value chain. Uh, so from one, from, from a, um, a seller to a buyer. Whereas the end consumer might need a bit more than just a short and concise info uh, on the gemological report, the end consumer might want to have some additional document um, informing a bit about, um, you know, what, what, what does it mean, a heated stone? What does it mean that this stone is coming from Madagascar? To explain a bit the somehow cryptic information on the report and also then maybe be a bit more um, broad and a bit, bit more explicit. So after having gone through these five points, I want to come to the conclusion. Um, first of all, inconsistency is part of the business. As long as we do not have a perfectly transparent um, supply chain, as long as gem labs are doing their way in this, uh, with this forensic approach, which they have to do, this is a reality. So um, certain things might change over time or from one lab to the other, other one, deal with it. Um, the labs can do a lot to improve the consistency by implementing standards and by trying to reduce the human factor. Then um, the, we want to, or as gem labs, we have to use technology a lot 
both for the uh, routine processes, such as analysis and interpretation, but also then to improve the process uh, on the ongoing basis. And the human brain, you know, is basically used to complement what the computer or the algorithm is doing by permanently challenging and improving this process. So we believe that the combination of machine, computers, algorithms with the human experience, the critical eye, is the most powerful and um, giving us the highest consistency over time. Then as a gemologist or as a gem lab, you should keep questioning and questioning yourself questioning what you're doing and also learning. It is okay to be confused sometimes. We should not pretend that we can deal with everything. There is new stuff coming up or um, exotic stuff that is confusing us. It's perfectly okay to be confused, but then you have to tackle it, address it and adjust your knowledge base accordingly. Then as a gem lab, we try to focus more and more also on the final, cons final consumer, the final customer, because he and she, these are the ones the final consumer is the one that is fueling, that is buying our products and, and um, paying all of us for our work. And then we also try to help and promote the definition of international standards. The more international standards we have, maybe even a global standard that we might have in the way we do our, our work, the higher the consistency that we can achieve in our work. Thank you very much for your attention and see you next time. Thanks.